Okay, welcome. I am here today with Dr. Robert Kolb, Professor Emeritus at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, where we are today. Um, a bit of a stormy day, actually, stormy spring day. But uh, Dr. Kolb, wonderful to have you with us today. It, it's great to do this with you, Josh. Now, I, I checked on the website. It says you're Professor Emeritus, but you also told me that I think you're teaching four courses at the moment and here, there and everywhere. So I'm not really sure what that actually means to be retired in your situation. <laughs> I'm not sure either. Mm. Um, retirement wasn't really a concept in the 16th century, mm -hmm. where my students think I live. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm enjoying everything I do. Uh, four courses at one time is a little crazy, <laughs> but, um, but they're, uh, they're f most enjoyable. Mm. Uh, and uh, so it, it's just a, really a privilege and a blessing to be able to keep on going at, at my age. So. Mm. One of our um, dear older pastors in Australia used to say, not only not a concept in the 16th century, but in the scriptures themselves, no word for <laughs> yes. retirement. Yeah. And he finished up preaching in his mid-90s. Wow. Yeah. 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 Um, thank you for your time today. So m many of our uh, viewers may know you from your um, scholarly work and, and the many, many books that you have written. I don't know if you know how, how many are on your list these days. Well, they all say the same thing anyway. So. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and so what I was hoping to talk to you about today is a, a bit more of a personal um, story to find out, um, you know, who, who Dr. Robert Kolb is, and particularly your, your faith journey. If we could hear a little bit about that would be um, really great. And so perhaps we can go back to the start and you can tell us a little bit about where you grew up, your, your childhood, and, um, and particularly what sort of, uh, what was the religious flavour um, of your childhood, if, if, if any. Yeah. Um, I'm the product of a mixed marriage. My mother was a Norwegian Lutheran and my father a German Lutheran. Mm -hmm. And in those days, that was uh, not, it wasn't a problem at all. Mm. But, um, but my mother uh, learned from Pontopidin's um, catechism, and that's a pietist catechism. Mm -hmm. um, and my father from Luther's, uh, well, uh, Pontopidin was, was Luther uh, taken into the Nordic uh, culture. But um, I grew up in a, in a very faithful home. My parents helped found a uh, daughter congregation in my hometown of Fort Dodge, Iowa, uh, when I was uh, as, as six lay years people, old. Or as lay you? people, yep. mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, my, my father was a factory worker, mm -hmm. and uh, my mother had taught school, but um, had stayed home with my brother and me then. So uh, she didn't go back to work until. My brother was, was old enough so that she could uh, work in a hospital as a nurse's aide. Um, so um, my parents were very active in the congregation. Uh, my, my grandparents lived across the alley and they were a, a big f part of my growing up. Uh, but it, was a, it really was a, a growing up that was framed in many ways by Luther's small catechism. Hmm. That was the worldview that was conveyed to me uh, at home and in our little congregation as it started to grow. Um, my, uh, my great aunt and uncle who lived um, oh, 200 meters from us or so uh, had a huge, at least it, in my memory from three to 10 years old or actually to high school graduation, a huge picture of Martin Luther. So I think from, from very small on, my historical memories were, were dominated by that person. Interesting. And so mm. um, when I finally got to seminary, I, I thought very much about uh, being, becoming a, a, well, I thought a great deal about becoming a parish pastor, but I also thought about becoming a, an instructor in Greek because I, I loved the languages. And um, uh, or in New Testament, but finally decided on history, and uh, and for me that's been a good choice. Mm. Mm. So a, a, a childhood um, development of faith framed by Luther's small catechism is a very interesting way to put it. So can you tell us a little bit more about what that looked like um, in in the home 
and or in the congregation. So there would have been, I imagine, um, daily devotions at home or, and even catechesis at home. Are those the sorts of things that you're thinking about? We actually didn't have daily devotions, mm. and I blame that on the language shift. Um, my parents didn't catch, because I could go across the alley and hear Stark's Gebetbuch prayed every evening with my grandparents. It didn't do me any good because I didn't know German at the time. <laughs> but um, but it, it was a home in which the gospel was talked about and lived, actually. Uh, and so uh, the, the Ten Commandments were the order of life. Gotcha. Um, mm. The conviction that I was a sinner was always there, um, although I was a fairly well-behaved child. I don't remember being punished all that often. Um, but the love of Jesus Christ really stood at the center of just the presumption of how the day is going to work. Mm. Um, uh, my mother talked more than my father, and one of her favorite phrases was, the good Lord did this, the good Lord's going to do this. Um, the good Lord was, mm. was definitely present. and That uh, sort of piety that you... Yes, yeah, yeah it was just uh, instilled, and in, in from my grandparents uh, as well. Uh, and my Norwegian grandmother lived with us for a while, and uh, my memories of her are, are pretty faint because she died when I was quite small, but, um, but she came out of that same kind of um, um, pious tradition mm. uh, that, that life was really all about what the good Lord gives us and what we can do in his world for, for him and for his people. Mm. And where was this? In the U.S.? In what? Iowa. Iowa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and just two things are standing out in my mind as you, as you speak about your childhood. You mentioned a little bit about what sort of child you were and a little bit of your, your interest in studies already. Um, but also your, your father was a, a factory labourer, you said. Mm -hmm. and, and so where do you think this um, studiousness came from or the, or the love of, of study? It's quite... Interesting, your, your journey in that sense. Um, my Norwegian grandfather, uh, whose books my mother had inherited, uh, was, was not particularly well educated, but very intelligent. And he read voraciously. He himself was a free thinker and an alcoholic, uh, drank away the farm. So there was that, that element of tragedy that my mother talked about only, I think, as, as my brother and I got older. But, um, but th there was simply that interest that my mother and my father conveyed to me. Uh, they were both always reading different kinds of things. Uh, Popular Mechanics was my father's uh, journal of choice. And, uh, but for my, my uh, grandfather or grandparents, uh, I had the Encyclopedia Britannica, 1911, the 11th edition, the so-called best uh, ever uh, of Britannica, and, and just found that very interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, in addition to that, uh, he had books of various kinds, some really gruesome stories about the Spanish-American War, I remember, um, the kinds of things that young boys are interested in, I suppose. Uh, so there was that atmosphere in the home, too. And uh, I think when I was one or two years old, my uh, parents bought an insurance policy that at high school graduation was going to uh, pay out, and I forget the sum, it was a ridiculously low sum for four years of college. They were going to make sure that um, uh, my mother had completed high school and then had a very little bit of normal training, as we called it, in in her day, not really anymore in mine, teacher education. So she could teach in a country school for, for 10 years during the Depression before my parents got married. And um, um, my father had quit in his senior year of high school because he got a chance to go to Chicago to study in a trade school. But he, too, was intellectually curious. Mm. And I also had the blessing of a very good a public high school. Mm -hmm. Uh, our, our Latin teacher, Mary Boxwell, was uh, a Baptist Sunday school teacher, and she uh, taught a, a Greek, New Testament Greek, once a week, all three years of my high school career, wow. to uh, a very good friend of mine who became an Egyptologist, and to me. 
and well, and then uh, uh, another uh, a group of, uh, who were a, a year ahead of us and a group that were a year behind us. So, uh, so there was that intellectual mm. ferment and that expectation that um, uh, as the grandchild, great-grandchild of, of immigrants, um, America was the land of yeah. that kind of opportunity too. You're going to do something with it, yeah, that expectation. Yeah. And so you're going through the school years and, and you start to sense some sort of an interest in either studying theology or the pastoral ministry. Do you, do you recall when that first arose? In seventh grade already. Mm -hmm. um, my uh, high school English teacher, my last year of high school, told her colleague who was a member of our congregation, Bob's chief interest is in power. And in your Missouri Synod culture, power lies with the pastor. And that's why he wants to become a pastor. <laughs> I fooled her. I became a professor, and there's no power there at all. Um, but uh, I, I had, the, had the example of a good pastor, uh, a man named uh, Lothar Bräunig, who uh, influenced me a great deal and who taught me uh, so much in catechism class. It, I had just one other uh, friend, uh, actually whose family was from the same village as in Thuringia as, as the Kolbs came from. Mm -hmm. uh, so our families go back a long way. Uh, but he and I uh, were buddies in, in catechism class. He, actually, Pastor Brennick's predecessor, Pastor Brandt, had uh, introduced three years of catechetical instruction uh, and so uh, I had th three years, one year under Pastor Brandt and then two years under Pastor Breunig. And when I wrote my uh, doctoral exams, my professor at the University of Wisconsin gave me one fat pitch um, on, my, uh, uh, on my test, uh, compare the, the theologies of the Lord's Supper between Swingley, uh, Calvin, and Luther, I could have done that as an eighth grader. Is that right? I didn't need to go to grad school to get that down. And so, um, uh, so yeah, there was, there was just a whole bunch of factors that came mm. together mm. in that sort of immediate post-immigrant immigration generation. Uh, my brother is five years younger and has very, very little sense of his Germanness and Norwegianness. And that was still pretty powerful in my, my childhood. Mm. And so what were the next steps in that, that time then for a young man like yourself interested <coughs> in studying theology and the pastoral ministry? What were the options and where did you end mm -hmm. up? Um, I stayed in Fort Dodge for uh, high school. I could have gone to Concordia St. Paul, was the nearest of the Missouri Synod schools. Um, but the education was good and... and uh, so the, I suppose the most important elements were, were the Latin with the Greek bonus uh, on one afternoon a week. Uh, but also I, I attribute a lot to excellent instruction in, um, in English uh, so that I had some practice at writing and some practice at um, uh, not only expressing myself but knowing how to, um, how to use the language uh, rhetorically, effectively, and I, I think that had a profound influence. Uh, so then, then my my parents were opposed to my going into the ministry. Um, okay. In this little mission congregation, uh, the, some people had beaten up on the first pastor pretty badly, and so uh, and Pastor Breunig had come out in 1931 from the seminary and couldn't get a call, so he wasn't. He wasn't terribly anxious to see people risk that again, even yeah. though the situation was different. But he was also very supportive and, and took a lot of time with me. Let me do little tasks around the church and, and whatnot. He was really a good mentor. Uh, and so that all prepared me to go to Concordia College in St. Paul. Uh, and uh, then I just kind of followed the course through and um, and focused in college at the senior college in Fort Wayne, uh, focused on Greek and Latin, uh, and decided really at the seminary then to refocus uh, 
onto church history. Mm -hmm. So that, as I tell my colleagues, I have an earned STM in um, New Testament. There are no honorary STMs, but um, uh, it was a very good year specializing in the New Testament, and, and it's helped a lot then with with understanding Luther the exegete, Luther the professor of mm. biblical theology. And so in terms of those years of um, that theological study and, and training, how, how, was, how did that interact with your own faith journey? You know, for some theological students, it can be a time of testing, it can be a difficult time. For others, it's a bit of a mountain top experience um, and every, everything in between, I, I think. Some people feel some sort of a process of being deconstructed before being built up, built up again. Um, do you recall much about your own faith you know, experience during those, those years? No. Mm. I think it's quite, quite a boring story, as mm. a matter of fact. I tell my students that on a, on a scale measuring emotions from 1 to 10, my emotions will fluctuate wildly between 3.4 and 3.7. <laughs> not, not, you know, rashly in a day, but over a month or so, <laughs> I'll have these, these emotional fluctuations. So um, I can stage excitement when I'm trying to lecture, but, but I'm, I'm pretty boring inside. Steady, pretty steady she goes, we say in yes. Australia. Steady she goes. That's, mm. that's the word for it, yeah. Mm. Um, so I don't remember any major faith crises. Mm. I, I had a friend um, who later taught at Luther Seminary, but who had been a Missouri Synod Lutheran uh, earlier, and said the difference between, um, between Missourians, who are pietistic, even though they don't want to admit it in many ways, and Norwegian pietists, um, was that we knew we were sinners, we confessed our sin, we knew we were forgiven, and we got on with life. Whereas, and, and this may not have been the Norwegian and German backgrounds, but it may have been simply the, the difference between his growing up years and, and the growing up years of his students. Students were much more often in some kind of, of spiritual, emotional, psychological crisis. Okay. And, and came much more often to the professor's office to, uh, to work through deep psychological problems. I don't ever remember. I had a crisis when I got my uh, second quarter of B's in dogmatics, my first year of <laughs> seminary, um, and went to the dean. And he had obviously seen people like me before. So he helped me take it a whole lot more lightly. Mm. And um, it's, a, it's a little bit embarrassing to have somebody who had B's in dogmatics now teaching systematic theology here. but. Uh, and so, just to backtrack, with seminary, did you end up here? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, in those days, that was the track, and mm -hmm. uh, the the education, both at Concordia St. Paul and at, at the senior Concordia Senior College in Fort Wayne, was excellent. Mm -hmm. um, so that uh, uh, my my Greek and my Latin. My Greek isn't as strong as it was then, of course, but my Latin I've kept up because I'm reading Latin texts often. And uh, so uh, excellent background in, in all ways. And, uh, and, and, so, and here too, I, I loved my professors. I disagreed with them, um, especially on, on um, historical critical examination of scripture. Um, but uh, I was plunged into scripture and the Lutheran confessions. I had uh, Ralph Bowman, Arthur Carl Peepcorn, and Robert Preuss for the three quarters of confessions we had at that time. And uh, that was just excellent preparation mm. for where I finally ended up mm. with, with the Book of Concord. Mm. Um, you, you mentioned the, the higher critical uh, views of, of Scripture, and I'm, I'm partly resisting asking you too many questions about Seminex <laughs> because it could be a whole other uh, tangent, but I, but I must. You, you were a student here during that time, is that correct? No, no. Uh, after I uh, graduated, I, I went to the University of Wisconsin mm -hmm. and uh, was getting my Ph.D. I got it in 1973, but in 1972 I returned to St. Louis mm -hmm. um, because my, one of my seminary mentors, Carl Meyer, uh, was uh, heading the Center for Reformation Research and, uh, and wanted to ease 
not, not completely ease out of that, but have somebody else do the, the, the trivial things. And so he got me here as his assistant. Um, the center didn't really have money to pay me, so he got the synods. Um, uh, we had at that time a literature board that produced research projects, and he had me work on the background of the formula of Concord, which mm -hmm. fit in very nicely with, with what I had done at the University of Wisconsin for a dissertation. So I was back here, and a month after uh, I arrived, or took over the position in September of 1972, Kalmeyer died. And uh, Arthur Carl Peepcoin then took his place as director, but with the same understanding that I would more or less do the administration, and, and they would be the they were each the public face of the center. Uh, and then uh, Arthur Carl died, and um, nobody else wanted the job, so uh, <laughs> they had had me uh, stay on as director. Uh, but as uh, when Carl Meyer died, I started teaching one course a quarter as well as being at the Center for Reformation Research and working on Jakob Andre's six Christian sermons that mm -hmm. led to the, uh, to the, finally to the solid declaration of the Book of Concord. So, um, so I was in the midst of that, and uh, uh, when when the students and faculty members, the majority of them went into exile. I was, I was in my second quarter of teaching. <laughs> or was it my first quarter of teaching? No, it was about my fourth quarter of teaching, I guess. And I wasn't going to, um, to let church politics interfere with my teaching. I was enjoying this. So when the students didn't want to come back on campus, I said, come to our apartment. And I'm the only person who gave grades at both places in the wow. critical uh, quarter. And then, uh, for me, there, there wasn't any doubt on which side I stood. So I continued to, um, to teach here one, very occasionally, I think, two courses a quarter, while I did my research and administered the, the center. Okay. So, and then I went to Concordia St. Paul as a professor. That was a delight to... To return to the place you'd studied, I think mm. I had six out of a, a collegium of about 60 professors. 16 of them had been my professors um, less than a decade earlier. Mm. Well, so, for, for those of you who aren't um, familiar with the story of Seminex, I encourage you to look it up online and get a bit more context for what we're talking, talking yeah. about. But we won't go into it in, um, in too much more detail today. It, it was the worst year of my life. Okay. And, I li and, and if I had to pick years that um, I could get along without, there'd be lots more that would go before that one would. Mm. Very mm. valuable lessons. Mm. Uh, also about the Holy Spirit and about how Christians ought to act toward each other. Mm -hmm. In regards to the Holy Spirit, what do you mean? Um, let me tell you my favorite Bible story. It didn't actually happen in the Bible, but it's a Bible story. Uh, in 1971, um, my wife and I were in, in Göttingen uh, and were attending uh, Martin Luther Congregation of the Old Saxon Free Church, the Missouri Synod's mission to Germany in the end of the 19th century. And we got to go to the last pastoral conference of uh, the old Saxon Free Church because in, the, in January of, of 73, or January of 72, January of 72, um, the, uh, the, the three uh, free churches, uh, free Lutheran churches in Germany were going to merge, and the, the uh, East people couldn't do the merger uh, and so the Saxon Free Church was going to divide, and the Saxon Free Church in the East then went to the Wisconsin Synod, actually. I got to represent President Bowman in, the, I think, the last conversation that tried to bridge the gap, but it was too, too late by that time. Um, at any rate, so we went to East Berlin for two days to meet with the, with the families of the pastors and the pastors uh, from the East. And there were all these signs about the, the heart, the soul, the mind of the people is the party. 
and, and just crazy propaganda. And then part of the, the ritual of that annual pastoral conference was to tell the stories of harassment that, uh, that it, it wasn't the kind of persecution the church suffered in the Soviet Union, hmm. but um, it wasn't pleasant. And uh, so I said to one of the brothers, how can, uh, how can the church survive, humanly speaking, uh, under these conditions? And he ignored the, uh, the uh, uh, humanly speaking part. Oh, I should have said as a preface, Walter Ulbricht was at that time both a head of party and head of state. Uh, he had brought the two offices together uh, in, in the communist East Germany. So he simply said, Walter Ulbricht is not the lord of the church. Uh, well, I knew I wasn't, so that doesn't leave a whole lot of candidates. It must be the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I second-guessed the Holy Spirit. I don't know why he hasn't made the Germans learn more about how to be Christian uh, after the experiences of the last 75, mm -hmm. 80 years, 90 years. Um, but through a series of ex experiences, I suppose, in those years, I had to realize that the Holy Spirit hasn't done too bad a job over 2,000 years with the church. Maybe he does know more than I do. Mm -hmm. And that's a very liberating, um, mm -hmm. liberating uh, feel and, and feeling and, and um, insight, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, very important uh, words for us in our day as, as well, trusting the Holy Spirit's guidance of the church. Uh, you mentioned your wife in, a, in amongst all that um, story as well, and so we were back at theological training and seminary, and so where, where did you meet your wife, and when did at, you? At, at Concordia St. Paul in the first months as we were freshmen, and we um, then dated over six years. She went to Concordia St. Paul, and then uh, it was a two-year college at that point, so she finished at Concordia Seward and uh, taught then here during my first two years, and we married as uh, we went on vicarage. And uh, she's been really a partner in, hmm. in the enterprise. Uh, so no problems with seminarians getting married in those days? Um, the, it was a shifting kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it changed for the, in, in St. Louis, uh, began to change right after World War II because uh, soldiers came back from Europe and they had married mm -hmm. uh, often their high school sweethearts. So they lived in the woods in, in um, what was it called? Not Shantytown, but it was a Shantytown. <laughs> um, oh, I've forgotten the name of the, the village out in the, in the woods where the, where the brick apartments now stand. But these were, t I don't know if they were tired. I think they were actually Quonset huts, these metal mm -hmm. things that you used for chickens and, and so forth on the farm in Iowa. Um, and so that had begun to change. Uh, before World War II, you weren't supposed to be thinking about a girl until graduation and supposed to be married before you took your first <laughs> call a week later. Um, Small window. Yeah. Yes. Well, everybody knew how the game was mm -hmm. played. but. Um, so, no, by, by my time, I don't think you could come married unless you had some special situation. And there were a few that, that had the special situation. They were a little older or mm. uh, something. But, um, but you could get married after your first year. And then, um, and we got married after my second year. And so, uh, yeah, things were changing in that era. Yeah. And um, you mentioned um, that it's, she's been an important partner for you the whole, the whole way through. And any other reflections on, on marriage and, and your own faith journey? Um, I think it's, it's so much help when you, when you share a common faith. Um, we follow uh, Luther's suggestion that, uh, that lay people can um, absolve each other, so we've practiced that. Mm. Um, I tell my students it's a bad idea because you don't have any sins of your spouse to hang over their heads if you do that. <laughs> but it, um, I think it, it's an important part of Christian living. And, and so um, she has very patiently borne 
my spending my time with uh, people who have been dead for over 400 years uh, and, um, and uh, read and proofread and, and so forth. So it's, uh, it's been a very helpful and mm. supportive partnership. Mm. Your um, life after seminary has been dominated by uh, teaching and, and the um, scholarly world of theology. Um, do, did you know that was happening at seminary? Did you anticipate um, a, a life as a pastor, or were you, could you see by that time you were heading towards teaching? I think kind of both. I still was talking about uh, being a, a pastor on the Kansas prairies. Mm. I don't know why I talked about Kansas <laughs> prairies. I'd not been there at that point yet. Um, but I also, from from. Uh, I think my first or second year of college was interested in, in maybe teaching Greek. I was fascinated mm -hmm. by the languages. And um, so it, I, it was still an open option for me. And then when, when I graduated, I, I um, stayed for one year of further work and got an STM in New Testament. Um, but during that year, I decided I'd like to do a doctorate. Talked to as many professors as I could uh, and uh, said, should I go out and in five years start a doctoral program wherever I am at a university or come back here? Uh, or should I start now doing summers in a doctoral mm -hmm. program here? Uh, or should I try and do the doctoral work and be done with it and then do whatever it was, I was going to do? And uh, I think all of them to a man said, uh, if you can manage it, uh, get it done. Mm. And I'm not sure that's the wisest decision, but it's it's the one then that I, I made. Well, as someone coming back and doing it at this stage of life, I, there's certainly benefits to it, I can, <laughs> I can tell you. Yeah. Mm. Well, and and one of the things that enabled, uh, enabled that was that there was a group of five, uh, four in, in my my class and, and one a year younger, who were very close, some of us from, from grade school on. Mm. Uh, and the father of one of them uh, was the uh, personnel manager for George A. Hormel and Company, the, the um, hog processing, processing uh, uh, actually giant in the food industry. And he decided a few years before his son got to be a senior in high school that one way to solve the problem of summer vacations was to hire um, college students because they would spend three months and go back. Mm. Uh, under the rules of the game, once you were hired at Hormel's, you had a job at Hormel's. Mm -hmm. And occasionally he lost his bet and, and somebody mm -hmm. stayed on and <laughs> lived the rest of their lives. In, well, they didn't live in Fort Dodge because George A. Hormel closed the plant. But um, so I wrote, worked six summers Mm. The highest paying job in town. I was making more than my father, who had been at that job at that point 20 some years. Um, and so that enabled us financially to, to think of grad school. And Carl Meyer, uh, whom I mentioned before, was a good friend of Robert Kingdon, who was probably the premier scholar of the impact of Calvin and Geneva on the French Reformation, on, on the Reformed Church in France, mm -hmm. which was a perfect fit for my interest in what Luther and Melanchthon did in terms of their impact on their students and, and where Lutheranism went from there. And so uh, we agreed that I could write my dissertation on Nicholas von Amsdorf. So all of that worked together, mm -hmm. um, and it, again, I couldn't have planned all that. Mm. Uh, mm. that. That's why I really do believe that, that our lives are in the Lord's hands. <laughs> but that's the way it unfolded. Mm. And so... Uh, There's so much uh, we could talk about in terms of your um, scholarly career. Uh, one of the things that stands out to me just in personal conversation with you and having been in uh, one of my very first classes here was, was um, with you is your connections around the world. 
And, um, and so I know from Australia that you have significant connections there. You, these days you spend, I think, up to half the year in, in Germany and have for quite some time. And um, you're speaking with Canadians this afternoon and, and um, a lot of uh, our friends from South America speak highly of you and, and very, uh, various other places. So I'm just curious about um, the significance of those international connections uh, for you and um, whether that was also something that was unexpected and um, any, any reflections on that? Certainly unexpected. I mm. hardly got out of Webster County as a kid. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, but one of the big factors was coming to the Center for Reformation Research, which gave me contacts with, with Reformation scholars across the country. Carl Meyer had helped organize with another good friend of mine, uh, Bob Schnooker, uh, both the 16th Century Studies Conference and the 16th Century Journal. And when he died, I um, played a, a minor role in the 16th Century Studies Conference, um, but a, 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 I was associate editor of the 16th Century Journal with Bob Kingdon, my advisor, and Bob Schnooker, this friend who just died at age 90 uh, two weeks ago now. Great loss, Presbyterian pastor. Uh, who taught at, at uh, Truman State in, in Missouri. But, um, but those connections then through the journal and the, mm -hmm. and the Center for Reformation Research gave me c connections across the country and into Canada. Uh, and then um, John Johnson, who was president of the seminary here, had been my graduate student during my years at the center uh, and teaching here. And uh, John wanted me to come back, and he knew that I loved college teaching, so he figured the way to get Cole back is to let him go abroad, because he's always been interested in that, that sort of thing. It was just uh, at the time that uh, the wall had fallen, there was the great opening, um, the, 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 the change, as we say, mm -hmm the turn in German, um, came and Synod was reaching out in a way that it, it should have done earlier, I suspect, to uh, churches which, which weren't partner churches but which uh, were eager to have input uh, from a confessional Lutheran perspective. And so uh, we spent uh, three months of the year uh, in Estonia, Latvia, and not in Lithuania, unfortunately, in Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, and Russia. Um, and the delightful thing about those experiences, I would come for a week seminar or sometimes a three-day conference or sometimes a whole month. I taught graduate courses, uh, courses for doctoral students in Bratislava and Slovakia a number of times. So uh, I, I got those kinds of experiences. And, and already in, in 1971 and, and in 7071, when we were in Germany, we had gotten to know our partner ch churches at that point, partner church then by the time, almost shortly after we left. Uh, they're celebrating their 50th anniversary this year, and I'm supposed to speak at, at, mm. the, at the grand celebration as an outsider. And I'm not, I don't feel totally an outsider mm. for our partner church in Germany. So at any rate, I, I got, had those connections. Uh, the Australians, where did I get to know Jeff Silcock? I actually got to know Jeff in Germany mm. when he was working on his dissertation. Um, but he was a graduate student of ours. And, uh, and so uh, Morris Schilt and I were together at a couple mm. conf Luther congresses and, and so forth. So uh, I don't know, the Lord's just... just I keep saying they didn't want me to have too much contact with students here, so they sent me overseas <laughs> for half the year. Um, uh, and the deal was, if, if, if I would sacrifice three months uh, in Eastern Europe, I could have three months for my own research and writing. And that, okay. that's got to be done in Germany, of course. Mm. The documents are there. Mm. And so, uh, yeah, so wow. it's wow. just... Yeah, I mean, my first course here, one of my first courses, I was still in Australia um, because of uh, COVID. And so because of technology, we could do all this online. And it was, I was in Australia. We had people in South America. It was through this institution um, in the United States. 
and you were in Germany. <laughs> and so I don't know what time it was for you. It was about three in the morning for me. The students here, it was some reasonable time. But um, it's quite amazing what, we, what happens these yes. days. Yes, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. been a great blessing uh, for me uh, with all the tragedy that has gone with mm. COVID. But it opened up the chance to actually teach in India again. <laughs> we got uh, four times to India, wow. uh, three times for a month at a time where I had two or three courses at Gurukul, the Tamil Evangelical Lutheran Church's mm -hmm. um, seminary. Uh, it had at that time a, a member of one of our, part, our Indian partner church was the principal, and so he, uh, uh, he wanted me to teach confessions and Luther there. And he got me back because he's working now with Martin Luther Christian University in, in Northeast India in the tribal lands. So I got 14 weeks, twice a week, with 32 Indian pastors and students hmm. uh, talking about the Lutheran confessions. And what could be more fun than that? Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Um, so, Dr. Kolb, at, at this stage of your life, as you look back over your uh, journey and your, your Christian life, I'm curious about the things that you're uh, most thankful for, but also perhaps before that, do, do you have regrets? <laughs> I suppose I should have. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. Mm. What are you most thankful for? If I can speak as a theologian, I really am thankful for Martin Luther and for the insights that our tradition can give to the whole church. Mm. And I think um, uh, in, in North America, my own church body has been just too reluctant to be bold in its getting into conversations. It's as though we're afraid of losing something. Hmm. And, um, and I don't think the, the message of the gospel works that way. But I think I, I am now teaching a, a course that's prescribed by a university that is being used by the Garuna Foundation um, in, in Southeast Asia for a group of eight uh, students to get a master's degree. But the, the course that's imposed on Christian doctrine uh, Actually, one of the textbooks is, is by a friend of mine, Michael Horton, a, a great mm -hmm. Reformed uh, theologian, and, and the other is not a bad textbook, but it is ref both mm -hmm. are Reformed. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they're teaching the atonement, pretty much the same. Luther emphasizes we are raised for our justification a little bit more than, than in these books, but uh, on, on many doctrinal points, the, couldn't have a better textbook. The pastoral feel for how you use the doctrine uh, is harder to get across. Hmm. It's not hard to get across because I share uh, on our posts, I share uh, things on the distinction of law and gospel, the distinction of passive and active righteousness, the distinction of the, the horizontal uh, and vertical realms uh, or kingdoms, as, as we confusedly say, because Luther talked about God's uh, kingdom and, and Satan's kingdom and um, God's right-hand kingdom and left-hand kingdom, and we mix that all together mm -hmm. too easily. So I like to use realm for the, for the, the two dimensions of human life. But though, the theology of the cross, for instance, that that God operates in this world through uh, his own suffering and death uh, and resurrection and through our suffering, uh, but that he remains in part the hidden God as well as the revealed God and, and we can only trust in him. Uh, I think I'm thankful for, for Luther's understanding of trust as the, as the very center of our lives. The North American, German-born North American psychiatrist Eric Erickson talked about trust as fundamental to human personality. And he was, he was catching an insight that Luther had had mm -hmm. and that Luther simply got from Paul and from Isaiah and from Moses, uh, that whole relationship with God as the key. So um, I am so very thankful for being born into this Lutheran tradition, uh, tradition in the sense of what has been handed down to us now for, for uh, 500 years almost. Um, and, and then I, I'm profoundly thankful for the chance to uh, spread the word, to, to have the kinds of contacts around the world I've had. 
Uh, and I'm thankful also for uh, the whole team uh, that has, has taught me and continues to teach me, including my students. Um, one of the reasons I'm still teaching is because I learned so much. Um, but several colleagues here and, and uh, one particular colleague in Germany and, and uh, a number of colleagues have been conversation partners that have enriched me. And uh, I tell my students, um, plagiarism in the service of the gospel is no sin. In this course, we're under the law, however. <laughs> Uh, but um, but I have borrowed, stolen, and, and um, taken over from these friends mm. such valuable insights. Mm. Mm. And uh, so the conceiving of also the ministry of teaching as a team effort, whether you're giving individual lectures or whether you're, whether you're um, in a kind of cross-disciplinary maybe or uh, uh, it, it, I teach with two colleagues here, uh, Confessions in part. And so uh, th that's been an, another thing for which I'm profoundly thankful. Mm. Mm. Uh, there, there really shouldn't be lone rangers in theology. Mm. There can't be. It's a community project. Thank you for that. Um, you've lived through some profound changes in, in the world and, and in the church and some of those you've, you've mentioned and um, I don't think you make any claims to being a, a, a prophet but as you look forward perhaps as we um, bring this conversation to, to a close, um, do you have a sense of um, things that are changing at the moment in the world and in the life of the church and what things are going to look like for the next generation of, of you know, Lutheran pastors and Lutheran theologians and um, any any words that you'd leave us with today about the future? No. Hmm. I, had a, I had a hunch you'd say that. <laughs> Probably give it a go anyway. <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad for that answer because it's just it's just within the last week or two that I've struck on something that I should have recognized a whole lot earlier, and this came I think out of conversations in class actually with with students. But looking at the past. A Lutheran says, lot, lot to regret, um, but Christ took that all to the cross. So it's buried in, in God's tomb, and it's not, not there anymore. Look to the future. Who knows what could happen? If I'd have predicted the future 50 years ago, I wouldn't have gotten the half of it right. Mm. Um, I never thought the wall would fall, for instance, hmm. to talk about grand things, and I never thought that I'd have the opportunities that I've had, uh, on the other hand. Um, Lutherans are, are, have a sense of calling, and calling is a very present thing. Hmm. And so you just, I think, muddle through, um, knowing that the future really does lie in God's hands, and knowing from the theology of the cross that there will be suffering and there will be persecution, the cross is one of Luther's marks of the church, but that, that, that the Holy Spirit will continue to be present, continue to bless, continue to support. Uh, and with him on your side, you just can go in a rather carefree way. Um, as one of my friends uh, at the University of Frankfurt an der Oder in the 1560s said, with a free and merry spirit, mm. and uh, know that the end is already secure, whatever steps into the future, the end is secure, mm. and we can live with that. Yeah. One of the verses I still like to quote from the King James, I say still, not that I ever grew up with the King James, but is our Lord sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. As the thunder um, cracks in the background. <laughs> yes, yeah. and, and the goodness. Mm. Uh, mm. Sufficient to the day is also the goodness that we experience. Not everybody in the world today is experiencing that goodness uh, as we are. But yeah. uh, Well, thank you very much for your um, time today, Dr. Kolb, and for your generosity gosh. both um, in uh, having this conversation but also uh, to your many students and um, and for your service to uh, the Lutheran world um, and, and to the body of Christ. Um, yeah, we're, we're thankful to God for you. 
I'm, I'm thankful to him for students like you uh, and for, uh, for all that he's, he's given me uh, in opportunities particularly. God bless you. God bless you.